this difficult day, it's perhaps well to ask what kind of a nation we are and what direction we want to move in. What we need in the United States is not division. What we need in the United States is not hatred. What we need in the United States is not violence and lawlessness, but is love and wisdom and compassion toward one another. But more importantly, to say a prayer for our own country, which all of us love. You can be filled with bitterness and with hatred and greater polarization. Or we can make an effort, as Martin Luther King did, to understand compassion and love. Come on, church. Come on, church. Let's stand and give the Lord a hand in all the campuses. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand. Say, Jesus. Uh, every time I hear that and other speeches like that, I get choked up. Um, years ago, we were at a Thanksgiving dinner with my family, and uh, my mother and father were still there alive and with us, and we were standing around in a circle, um, my two brothers and two sisters. And my mother started crying, and right before we prayed, she said, this is all I ever wanted, was that we would be together. And when God looks at uh, the, ch the church and the world, all, all the people he made in his image, every single person, he says, I just want them to get along. I just want them to love each other. And from this day forward and in, in all the sermons for this series, um, I just want you to know that's the heart of everything that's going to be communicated, that God would unite us. He made every single one of us in his image. He loves every single one of us. And I believe, this is my opinion, the devil is overplaying his hand and we, we've become so divided that people are starting to say I'm tired of it. And we got to do something about it. Amen. <laughs> But it's going to require, all you have to do is take care of you. You don't need to take care of them. You don't need to take care of them. You just need to take care of you. And so my prayer is that you would receive everything that's spoken um, to heart from God. I want to say it from God. I want to ask all of you. I want to thank you. I posted a, vi a video on Instagram. If you don't follow me on Instagram, please follow me. Tomorrow morning I go to New York City and I'm having nine interviews in New York City uh, this week. I'm going to be on Fox and Friends and Huffington Post and other uh, outlets talking about this. And I pray that, amen. And, and I, I just pray for wisdom that, that, that in those interviews I say what God wants me to say. Um, and, uh, but I, I want you to pray for our country because we, we, I didn't write this book just to write a book. Uh, I wanted to do something different and something big and, and be a catalyst to nurture unity in our country. And it's going to start right here. Amen. We're going to start right here. Amen. So I want to say hello to all the people watching online and all the campuses. God bless you all. Uh, God's going to do something in all of our lives. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for your faithfulness. Lord, speak to us. Speak to us. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. Find someone who doesn't look like you and give them a hug. Amen. Amen. Hope to see all y'all Saturday at the simulcast and pray for all the churches and 200 sites around the country that are going to be at that. We're going to have a great time. Uh, let's see your Bibles on the count of three. Say word. One, two, three. Say word. word. One more time. Say word. word. Turn to Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. It is the fifth book of the Bible all the way from the beginning. If you're in the New Testament, you're lost. <laughs> All the way to the beginning. There is an ancient Chinese, uh, Japanese art form called Kitsugi. And Kitsugi believes that when you have broken pottery, that when it is repaired, and they use gold often to repair the cracks and put it back together, they believe that the repaired pottery is more valuable than the, the original. 
The devil has done a great job. He is very smart. He's done a great job through racism to divide us and break us apart. And to lead us to believe that some people are inferior or superior or different or should be hated. Some people are those people I need to stay away from them. He's done a great job of tearing us apart. However, we serve a God that puts things back together. Can I get amen? amen. Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17 that we would all be one. And that's what he wants to do. Uh, over the next five weeks, I want to talk about <laughs> how we got broken apart specifically today and how we can be brought back together. And my prayer is that you would let the Holy Spirit just work on you. Everyone say, I got to work on me. Very good. Let's, I just got to work on me. So we're going to start from the beginning. We're going to talk about um, what racism is and three, the, the kinds of racism. And then I'm going to tell you something that is hopefully going to set you free really quick. Um, I want to teach you today. Everyone say, teach me. Say, Holy Spirit, you are a teacher. Help me understand the information. Very good. Let's talk about three kinds of racism. Racism is when you discriminate against someone because of their, uh, by the way, ethnicity, not race. There's only one race, by the way. There's no such thing as a black race, a white race, a Hispanic race. That doesn't exist. There's only one race, the human race. We say that, but just know that there's only one race. There are ethnicities, right? Can we get those three kinds of uh, racism? So we got institutional racism. These are systems that are designed to keep people apart. And my sister was going to buy a house in Maryland. The real estate agent said to her, well, we have to find an appropriate neighborhood for your family. And she told her it was because they were black. And my sister, uh, being the, the hard-headed sister she is, said, I don't care. I'm going to move where I want to move, right? <laughs> and they did. They moved into one of the inappropriate neighborhoods. But because my brother-in-law was a cop and brought his cop car home and none of his cop car friends came, cops came in to help move their furniture in, they were the, the, the party of the street, okay? So everything worked out. But that's institutional racism, a lot of different kind of forms of that. Internalized racism is when people who have been discriminated against internalize the message and start to hate themselves. They start to discriminate against people like themselves. They deny their own culture, their own language, because they want to assimilate and deny who they are. Okay, you can do both. But anyway, internalized racism is when you turn on your own because you have been convinced that you are less than. Personally mediated racism is when you just direct something at somebody else. I don't like you. I don't trust you. You are scary to me. Whatever. These are the three kinds of racism, but I want to point out one thing, and, 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 and this is probably the biggest aha for me in writing this book, is that you can be racially offensive and not be a racist. I want you to internalize this. You can actually offend people, and by the way, on a regular basis, and not be a racist. Why? Because sometimes you don't even know you're doing it. Sometimes what you're saying is received, it is offensive because of the receiver of what you say. Sometimes people get nervous and say th certain things. The reason this is important to understand, and by the way, there are racists. No, don't get me wrong. But most people say I'm not, but yet we have this big divide. Because often we don't understand how we are interacting with each other and how we're not received by people. The reason this is so important is because I have talked to people all my life, trust me, about this issue. And when people don't believe that they can be offensive and not be a racist, they automatically attach, attach any offense that they're accused of to actually being a racist. And so, so therefore, because they will never accept that they're a racist, they will never accept they can ever do anything wrong. They can never learn. Same minute, that makes sense to you. You have to be able to say, yes, I have been offensive, but that wasn't my heart. Great, let's learn. I've learned so much in writing this book about things that I do that could be offensive to people. But that doesn't mean I'm racist. It means I'm growing, I'm learning. So I want you to approach all this information not from the point of if I admit to something wrong, I'm admitting to being a racist. No, you're not necessarily. You're just admitting to learning. This book is not about, and this sermon series is not about not being a racist. It's about being honorable. It's not about what you should avoid. God doesn't want us to avoid stuff as much as he wants to aggressively lean into loving people. I know in our culture, culture we always talk about we tolerate people. That's great, great. I don't want you to tolerate me. I want you to love me. I want you to come at me with some, some, some aggressive uh, love and affection and, po and speak life to me like I want to speak life to you. Can I get Amen. So let's learn about how we were divided and are divided. But more importantly, what can I do to be uniting, to be seek love and to promote unity? Amen? Okay. Amen? Okay. Uh, my background. I have a uh, white grandmother 
I have a half Chinese and black grandmother. My great-grandfather was from China, came to Jamaica with Cindy's, got jungle fever, and had babies. <laughs> Literally. Both my grandfathers are black Jamaican. My white grandmother, when she was young, her family sent her to Jamaica, Queens, New York, so she would not marry a black Jamaican from Jamaica. So she goes to Jamaica, Queens, New York, and it just so happened she meets a black Jamaican in Jamaica. <laughs> he was Jamaican twice because he was from Jamaica and he was in Jamaica. <laughs> she starts dating him. When he came to her house, he would have to go to the back door. Couldn't go in the front door. She married him. Her family cut her off. We never knew about them, never saw them, and they lived 15 minutes away. And, I, and growing up, I was like, there's all these brown people in my family. We're light brown. That's why I get this light brown color because we got all kinds of stuff in, in me. And, 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 and we were like, where did this white lady come from? She's grandma. We love her. But where she come from? Because no one else is white. <laughs> but she was grandma Dorothy. I mean, and, and, and the neighborhood I lived in was all black pretty much. Where I went to elementary school for eight years was all white, and it was just a mile away from my house to the school. The kids in the white neighborhood gave me, called me names because I was black. The kids in the black neighborhood called me names because I wasn't black enough. Mm-hmm. High, yellow, red, bone. All y'all know who know what I'm talking about. Shame on you. <laughs> I got it in both neighborhoods. Why? Because racism is sin and all are sinners. But I knew kids in both neighborhoods, by the way, who never went into each other's neighborhood. The white kids in my elementary school could not come to my house. And the black kids, we went there every now and then, but they would never come to my house. But it was very little relationship. But they both talked about each other. And I was going back and forth saying, both of y'all are wrong. Because there's cool people here and there's cool people here. That has been my journey. Every football team I went on was diverse. Our church is diverse. The Bible study I had at my house before we started this church is diverse. And I'm like... We can do this. We do it. Joshua chapter 15. How is it and why is it we are so divided? Everyone say us. Verse them. In every race conversation, it is about us versus them. If you watch the news, you are forced to pick a side. Are you on this side or are you on that side? Do you, believe it? Do you follow this news channel or do you believe in this news channel? Do you have this opinion against those people or do you have this opinion against those people? Culture will force you to pick one of two options. And I'm going to tell you there's a third option. Joshua is leading the Israelites into the promised land. And he's going in to claim the land that God promised Abraham. And as Joshua is leading the Israelites into the promised land, he's going to be confronted by the commander of the Lord's army. And he's going to ask the commander of the Lord's army, are you for us on my side or are you on the side of our adversaries? And the commander of the Lord's army is going to give us our answer to the third option. Look what it says in chapter 5, verse 13. It says, And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he was lifted, lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, a man stood opposite him with a sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said, Are you for us or our adversaries? Us versus them. That's our culture. Us versus them. And he said, No. <laughs> okay, do you want a hamburger or a hot dog? No. <laughs> you got to pick one or the other. <laughs> Do you want a hamburger or hot dog? No. I don't get it. He says, there's a third option. Neither one of your options is acceptable to me. It says, no, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Joshua fell on his face and worshiped. And he says, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said, take your sandal off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Culture will tell you you have to pick and you have to be on somebody's side against somebody. And it's one of those options are going to be the people who look like you. But I'm going to tell you a third option is that we honor what we all have in common. Instead of focusing on what is different or appears to be different, that we honor what we have in common, which is that we were all made in the image of God. And the image of God that each one of us was made in is not inferior or superior to anyone else. And that we place a priceless value, honor, respect on the fact that we were made for the purpose of living in relationship with each other, loving one another, forgiving one another, being empathetic and compassionate one another. Can I get amen? And if we would get past the us versus them mentality 
and focus on what we have in common. We are all genetically, humans are genetically 99.5% genetically identical, no matter what that person looks like. I was in the prison once uh, ministering, and I... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Man, I ain't no Pastor Miles went to jail. <laughs> I'm in a whole lot of jails. And this white supremacist was walking the track and I called him over to me to minister to him. He had no shirt on, he had tattoos everywhere and he stood right here. And little did we know that we were looking at genetic, looking in a genetic mirror of each other. And yet he, were, he was told to hate people like me. And what was ironic, he had tattooed his body so much he was blacker than me. He had all black ink right here. <laughs> Let's talk about how we got divided. Um, sociologists say and describe how we put ourselves into groups. They call it grouping. It's how we identify those not like me and those like me. The way we sort people into groups that are either like me or not like me. Every single one of us are in dozens of groups. For example, all the ladies in the house say hey. hey. Okay, all the mothers in the house say hey. hey. Okay, so if you notice that when I said all the ladies, it was like hey. And when I said all the mothers, it was like hey. <laughs> <laughs> we tired, we tired. <laughs> so ladies is a group. Mothers are a group. Single ladies, married ladies, divorced ladies. Grandmas are a group. Guys. Uh, mechanics, accountants, CPAs, college students, freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, you get the point. We are all in multiple groups. Can I get in, man? Make sense to you? And whatever groups you are in, you understand those people pretty well. You understand how they think, how they dress, how they walk, how they might respond to something because that's your group. You deal with them all the time. And so the people that are in part of the group that you're in, that's your in group. The people that are not in that group or any of those groups, those are your out group. Everyone say in group. In. Say out group. out group. The people in our in group, we understand pretty well. And we understand all the intricacies of how they dress, walk, think, et cetera. And the people in our out group, we don't understand because we don't hang out with those people. But we have little bits of information about those people. From our family, our friends, the media. Your social narrative, is a, a social narrative is a term that describes the story that has shaped how you see the world. It's what your parents told you, what your friends told you, the neighborhood you grew up in, how you were taught to interpret the news. That's your story, the social narrative. That creates the lens through which you see other people. And so the people in your in-group, you understand pretty, pretty intricately and, and you understand in detail. The people in your out-group, you don't understand. You just have anecdotal information, a, a quote here, a quote here, a headline here. And that's the information you have and that's the information you apply to the people in your out-group that you know very little about. It's called stereotyping. Understand when you're referring to the people in your out-group, the first thing you should say to yourself is, I have very little information that's factual about them. Doesn't mean you don't have facts, but you have very little facts about them because that's your out group. Are y'all following what I'm saying? Once you identify your in group, there's a thing called in group bias. In group bias is your tendency to give preferential treatment to the people in your in group. You feel more comfortable with them. So I want to read to you nine types of in group bias that you will apply to the people in your in group, whatever that is, whether it be gender, whether it be, whether it be ethnicity, whether it be occupation, whether, whether it be whatever level in, your, in the military you are, whatever level in your job you are. In group bias is the tendency to give preferential treatment to the people of who are like me, the people in my in group. I am more comfortable with those like me. I am more inclined to spend time socially with those like me. I am more patient with those like me. I give the benefit of the doubt quicker to those like me. I express more grace when mistakes are made by those like me. It is easier to communicate with those who are like me. I assume that I will get along easier with those like me. I am more willing to go out of my way to help those like me. I possess more and more positive assumptions about those like me. So all the people in your groups, this is how you naturally flow with them, the, the, how you naturally feel comfortable with them. And by the way, a lot of this is subconscious. You don't even know you're doing it. 
It's just how you, it's just what happens because you're comfortable and you have information, a lot of information about those people. In-group bias is how you give favor to the people in your in-group. The opposite is out-group discrimination. This does not mean you hate the people that are not like you, but it is, it is how you treat them different, less favorable to the people in your in-group. In, out-group discrimination, I am less comfortable with those not like me. I am less inclined to spend time socially with those not like me. I am less patient with those not like me. I give the benefit of the doubt slower to those not like me. I express less grace when mistakes are made by those not like me. It is more difficult to communicate with those not like me. I don't assume that I will get along with those not like me. I am less willing to go out of my way to help those not like me. I possess less positive assumptions about those not like me. I can't tell you how many times I have experienced discrimination that was racial, that felt exactly like that. Now, if we do that with people that we're just naturally around and has nothing to do with race, it doesn't matter what you call it. <laughs> it hurts. It gives people, puts people at a disadvantage. Are you following what I'm saying? Are you following what I'm saying? <laughs> Can I get an amen? And so as believers of Christ, God says, I want you to live at this level with everybody. Those like you. And not like you. I was explaining this to somebody, a very dear friend of mine who loves God and she is not a racist. But she said to me, um, I, why can't you just get over it? And I was like, huh. I said, you have spent too much time surrounded by your in-group. You might have heard that term, those people. Those people are the people in your out-group. We call it othering, the others and when you spend time in your in-group all the time and you don't know what it's like to have out-group discrimination, it's easy to assume it doesn't exist. Uh, there was a, there's a, a, a leadership coach here in San Diego, Stephen Jones, he wrote an article called The, the Right Hand, Right-Handed, of Privilege. If you are right-handed, raise your hand. Way up high, way up high, raise your hand really high. Keep your hands up on all the campuses, look around the room. And most people are right-handed. If you're left-handed, like I am, lift your hand up. Left-handed, okay, just very few of us. All the left-handed people say, hey, what's up? <laughs> Culture was made for right-handed people. You remember the desk in school? It was right-handed. Y'all right-handers, y'all were just sitting there. We, I hated y'all. Y'all just sit there. Just right. You didn't have to look around. You didn't have to look at your paper. You could just ride around. You just relax, relax. Us left-handed, remember left-handed? We're out here in space like this. <laughs> we have to draw our name, okay? It wasn't like we can write. We had, we out here like this. If you play golf, you can go to any golf shop and get your clubs if you're right-handed. Any golf club. Don't matter. If you're left-handed, you got to call in advance. Do you have this one? <laughs> Do you have this one? Maybe I got to order it online. And when I grew up, there was no online, so you just didn't get it. <laughs> if you want to get a, a baseball mitt, especially a catcher's mitt, if you're right-handed, you go to any store, any, any sporting store and get a, a mitt. But if you're left-handed, you have a disadvantage. You have to go to four and five stores. Maybe you can get that club, uh, that, that mitt. Can I, same minute, this makes sense to you. I want you to imagine culture was made for right-handed people. It doesn't mean it was made against left-handed people necessarily. But it was made by right-handed people for right-handed people. Now I want you to imagine the right-handers is an in-group. I want you to imagine the right-handers give in-group bias to right-handers. And when this lady said that to me, I said, you are right-handed and you live in a country where you are the in-group. And you're always amongst your in-group. You don't understand the left-handed disadvantage. You don't understand what it means to be on the out-group. And when you are always getting the benefit of the doubt that we just described, when you're always assuming you can communicate when you walk into work and the people in charge are your in-group and everywhere you go, your in-group is, is, is around you and you are getting the benefit of the doubt. Unless you are left-handed, you don't understand. Even shaking hands, we shake hands right-handed. I'm left-handed, so I'm always doing this. People think I'm like spastic, right? Why can't you? What are you doing? Well, I'm left-handed, so I'm, I'm now have trained to deny my left hand and to go right-handed. That's an advantage. Does it make you bad that you're right-handed culturally? 
No. But is it an advantage? Yes. Do you not realizing that advantage remove the disadvantage of the left-handed people? No. But what happens is when you're right-handed and that's all you've ever known, you can't fathom what it means to be left-handed. And when you hear someone talk about their disadvantage, you just say it doesn't exist because you don't experience it. It's a privilege to never have that burden. It's a privilege. So right hand, left hand, in group, out group, what do we do? Number one in your notes. Number one. Acknowledge your blind spot. A blind spot is the difference between your intent and your impact. I intend to be loving to everybody, but I offend people. I intend, intend to be kind to all women, but I'm creepy to some. <laughs> Ladies, can I get an amen? <laughs> you know exactly what I'm talking about. And people say, oh, yeah, I'm good, I'm good. But there's a, there's, a, there's a gap between what you intend and what you actually do. One of the things you can do really simply, ask somebody, and it could be someone who looks like you, but someone who doesn't, that knows you. Is there any way that I am offensive in things I say and things I do? I promise you, it happens all the time. People say things all the time and there are people in your life who are just whatever, that, that's just them. We can do better than that. And if you went to your friends and your family and said, are the things I say and things I do that are offensive to you as a white person, as a black person, as a Hispanic person, as an Asian person, please tell me. And if you have people in your life that will be honest with you, the Bible says, as iron sharpens iron, so another man, another woman sharpens another man, another woman. Let me tell you something. Ask that question. And you can get so, become so much more honoring by getting the answer to that question. It's things you think are funny. It's things you think are bridge building when in fact they're not. But people just are so accustomed to it, they just deal with it. Imagine if you can speak life instead of those little jabs that cause division. Can I get an amen? Number two, rename those people as your brother and your sister. Don't say those people anymore. <laughs> I want to look at a verse, Matthew 22, verse 37. It says, the greatest commandment. It says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor. Everyone say neighbor. As yourself. Turn to 1 John 4, 20. Or you can look at it on the screen. You can look, look it up later. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother. Everyone say brother. Say Sister. If, everyone, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. A liar. A liar. <laughs> oh, I love God. I can't stand those people. You're a liar. The Bible says. Miles doesn't say. He who does not love his brother or sister whom he has seen. How can he love God whom he has not seen? Why is this important? Everyone say neighbor. neighbor. Say brother. brother. Say sister. Those are labels of, uni of unity. Those are labels of love. Those are labels of family. When you rename somebody with all the derogatory terms we call each other and all the derogatory terms you hear on television about one group against another, listen for them. All the names people call those people. We have all kinds of titles we put on people. When you label somebody with something lower than neighbor, brother, or sister, not only do you dehumanize them, you attribute to them all the stereotypes, very little information, that you have about that label on them. And now you can no longer relate to them as an equal. Then you just dehumanize them. And you told them, go over there. That is that group of people. You're part of that group. And guess what you did? Subconsciously, or maybe even consciously, you just disqualified yourself from having to love them as your neighbor because they are no longer your neighbor. That's not my neighbor. That's a blank. That's not my brother. That's a blank. That's not my sister. That's a blank. Jesus said, if you love only your friends, what good is that? Anybody could do that. I want you to love the people who even hate you. That's a powerful, powerful requirement of the gospel. Imagine if you, everybody you saw, 
You said, that's my neighbor that I have to love. And when you do that, say that, and you feel something wrestling in your heart, guess where the issue is? In your heart. <laughs> and guess where God's going to do his supernatural work? In your heart. Can I get an amen? Oh, it's quiet up in here. Let me tell you something. God's doing something. Number three, number three. <laughs> Give in-group love to your out-group. Give in-group love to your out-group. I want you to start to pay attention to how comfortable, graceful, patient, forgiving you are with the people in your in-group. Let me tell you something. I have walked in when I used to play football, or even now, because, you know, I'm, I'm – you know, former Charger. I work in this room. It's like, oh, Chargers and in group. You're on our team. Hey, hey, here, have, have, have a seat. Let me have, let me give you some love. Let me give you some love. Hey, I, I'm a Raider. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> Next time you walk in Starbucks, I want you to look around the room and see what in group is predominant. And if you're part of the in group, I want you to look for somebody who's on the out group. Whether it's this. Or they're in a wheelchair. Or if you walk in a room and it's all men and there's one woman in the room. She's in an out group. And I want you to think, how can I, as a child of God, honor the image of God in that person who may even feel like they're the left-handed person in the room? How can I extend grace to them that we're all extending to each other? How can I go out of my way to welcome that person and give in-group Bias, love, patience, kindness, benefit of the doubt to that person in the out group. That's the challenge. Very simple. Very clear. I hope it's clear. Is it clear? Number four. Who? Acknowledge your brother or your sister's color. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was 20 something, uh, 27, 28 years old. Someone said to me, I don't see your color. Oh, I don't see color. And I thought that they didn't see red, blue, yellow, and green. I said, that's jacked up, man. You don't, you don't see all the color of the rainbow. And they said, oh, no, 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 I see all that. I just don't see your color. I was like, well, how did you know to tell me you don't see it if you don't see it? <laughs> I said, so, so what is it that you see? Did you put something on me that's not there? You know, when people go to Hawaii and get a tan, y'all lay out in the sun for, you know, Hours on hours on hours and come back shades darker. And when I say y'all, whoever, I mean, you know, don't, so don't, and he's talking about make people. <laughs> <laughs> Black people get tans, <laughs> right? My wife lays out and she gets nice and browner. <laughs> and you come back and you want everybody to see your tan. You wear your little spaghetti strap, your little macaroni strap. You want everyone to look at your tan. <laughs> hi, hi. Same minute if you know what I'm talking about. But it's amazing how if you get a tan in Hawaii, it's celebrated. If you get a tan in the womb, it's invalidated. All of a sudden we don't see it. You are insulting God. God made that tan. He gave, here's the trip thing about God. God said, I'm making, we're all basically brown. Melanin is a brown tint that God colored us all with. And it can change. The effect, the effect of the sun can actually make you browner. Some people can't. I get that. I'm sorry. <laughs> Some people don't get brown. They get red. But that's, you know, that, hey, whatever. That's, that's another color, by the way. Okay. <laughs> and, by, and by the way, I was watching Red Fox. Uh, Sanford and Son. Red Fox was a comedian. And Red Fox had a junkyard. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a comedy. And he was, um, he got robbed. And so in, the, in, in, in this episode, two cops came. Remember the white cop and the black cop? You always come to Red Fox's house. And the white cop was like, hey, Mr. Sanford, he was real by the book. And the black cop had to interpret for the white cop what Red Fox was saying. It was classic. So Red Fox got robbed. And the white cop says, Mr. Sanford, was the perpetrator colored? And he's like, yeah, he was colored white. <laughs> Culture would say you have two options, white people and people of color. God says, no, nah, it's just people of color. Because I made a rainbow, it's not even a rainbow, I made a spectrum of color. <laughs> Can I get an amen? <laughs> Celebrate the creativity of God. This is the creativity of God. 
You are the creativity of God. God says you are marvelous. Everyone say marvelous. So why would you say you don't see it? See it. Celebrate it. Now, don't see it and discriminate against it. See it and acknowledge it like you do and celebrate it. Don't, don't be scared. I know it's politically correct to say I get that, but you deny the burden of the color. Because each shade has a different burden. And you don't want to deny that burden. The Bible says that if you want to love your neighbor, you want to carry their burden for them and with them. Number five, uh, view every conversation as a consultation. In other words, every time you talk to somebody, you are having a race conversation. What does that mean? As soon as you look on somebody because you really do see their color, you really do see their hair, you really do hear their accent, you really do see their clothes, you really do notice their swag, their rhythm, or lack of swag and rhythm thereof. You put all that in your computer in an instant and your, and your, and your mind subconsciously says, here's probably what they're like, here's probably how they are, here's, pro here's how you need to act. Happens like that. Can't stop that, but you can challenge it. What I mean by that is that when you see all that and you program all that, that you allow them to self-disclose to you who they are. You allow them to self-disclose to you their intelligence, their pain, their dreams. And instead of imposing on them, remember, they're probably your outgroup. Often if they're your outgroup, you really don't know. You really only have anecdotal information, two or three or four or five facts. And instead of imposing on them what you think, allow them to self-disclose to you. Take your time to be a learner, not a judge. Be consulted. Number five. Amen. Number six. You can give the Lord a hand. That's okay. Let's go. Come on and give the Lord a hand. Give your heart to your outgroom. Unless we put our heart into this, it will not work. Uh, Rod Carew was a Hall of Fame baseball player. He was Panamanian, a little darker than me. And he played 18 years in the major leagues, three 324 batting average, 18-year All-Star, Rookie of the Year, MVP, boom. When he was 71 years old, which is about three or four years ago, he had a heart condition. He needed a heart transplant and a kidney. At the same time, 27-year-old NFL player, Conrad Rulin, who played at Stanford, was white, went into a coma, had an aneurysm. His mother goes into the hospital, is listening to his heart, and she says, you are going to wake up. I'm going to hear that heartbeat again. This is not the end. Conrad died. Conrad had signed his organs over to be donated. His heart and kidney went to Rod Carew. Conrad's mother calls up Rod Carew and says, Mr. Carew, I think you have my son's heart and kidney in you. He says, would you like to come listen to your son's heart? When Conrad was 11 years old, he met Rod Carew and came home and said, Mom, I met my hero and I'm going to be a professional athlete like him. And he ended up going to the NFL. She goes over his house. She listened to his, her son's heart in Rod Carew's chest. If we are so different, how is it that a white 27-year-old kid can put his heart into a black Panamanian's chest? The devil has us duped. God said, I made one race in my image that they would walk together in relationship with me and each other. And we are now going to honor what we have in common. Can I get an amen? In a minute, I'm going to pray. I want to pray. And I want to pray that God give you a new heart. Now, I'm going to pray. And if you pray this prayer with me, you're not admitting, oh, I'm a racist. I have to not be a racist, as I said in the beginning. You're praying that, God, praying that we can honor one another better. We can humble ourselves and say, Lord, how can I be more loving? How can I be more honoring? How can I be more accepting? Change the lens through which I see other people. Some of you need to ask Christ to be your Savior. So this is going to be a prayer of salvation for you. But no matter what it is, let's walk this series together and let's change our church, our city, our country. Can I get amen? Amen. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, thank you so much for your faithfulness. Dear God, I just pray for wisdom through this series. Pray for 
blessing next week at the simulcast that as the churches around the country and people around the world watch, that you would deposit hope all around the country, that there will be a movement of unity. Pray against the devil. I know he's like a roaring lion looking to whom he will devour, but you are the lion of Judah. If you would like a new heart, for whatever reason, for whatever reason, you want Christ to forgive you of your sin, you want to be encouraged because you've been hurt, wounded, you have resentment, hatred, whatever. God made you in his image so he can love you. And he just needs you to invite him in. So if you would like to ask Christ into your heart for whatever reason, his peace into your heart for whatever reason, pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart. Pray, dear God, I know you love me. I know you have an incredible plan for my life. And I want to be part of the solution. Forgive me. Fill me with the spirit of God. I know Jesus died and rose from the dead that we would walk in victory and in relationship with the living God. I surrender my life to him. Holy Spirit, fill me. Take over my life. As all of our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, if you prayed that prayer in a minute, I'm going to ask you to stand up in all the campuses. And your standing is a physical representation of a new start in your life for whatever reason you prayed. God wants to do something in your life. He wants all of us to become vision carriers of unity and love and honor. So I'm going to count to three, and if you prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask you to stand up. One, two, three. Stand to your feet. God bless you. If God spoke to you during that sermon and you feel like you want to ask Christ to be your Savior, it's as simple as A, B, C. One, admit and accept that you are a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and he died for your sin and rose from the dead. And then confess yourself as a sinner and say, Jesus, please forgive me of my sin. So if you would like to ask Jesus Christ to be your savior, I just want you to just look at me right now and pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart, knowing that God knows you and loves you very much. Say, dear God, I believe that I'm a sinner I know the penalty of my sin is death, and I don't want to die and go to hell. But I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he died and rose from the dead for my sin. And I confess myself a sinner and ask him to forgive me of my sin. Jesus, please forgive me of my sin and fill me with the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, you just ask Christ to be your Savior, we want to know. And we want to email you some resources. So if you just prayed that prayer with me to accept Jesus as your Savior, click on the link that just appeared, and we want to send you some free resources. God bless you, and we'll see you in heaven.